He is forever mine. Praise the Lord. We've been in this series of messages, and maybe you're just now here for the first time as part of the series. We welcome you to it. But we're on the part five of our series of Journey to the Cross. As we've gone through it, we've looked at uh, so much that the Lord has done for us, and we see so much of uh, prophecy being fulfilled and from the Old Testament in regard to Jesus' first coming. Most of the time, we focus on prophecy. We're thinking about that uh, second coming of Jesus. Wouldn't be a second without a first, by the way. And the first is well prophesied as much as the, first, as the second is. And you see in this message today, a lot of prophecy being fulfilled from the Old Testament. We'll, we'll look at some of those things. But let me just kind of quickly review where we've been over the last four messages. When we started this series, we started in the upper room where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And we dealt with that, the implications of that, and the lessons from that, and the Passover. And this is Passover season. It's Passover time where Passover meals being shared. The next day, the sacrifice, uh, Passover lamb is going to be sacrificed. Remember, out of the Passover meal, Jesus took the two elements of the bread and the wine and instituted the Lord's Supper. He forever do that. In fact, the Sunday after Easter, you don't want to miss that service. We're going to have a glorious time as we celebrate that communion time and remember the Lord Jesus together. Can't have a better time to do it than right after Easter. Amen. Then from there, Jesus shared his thoughts with them. Final words, which are always profound words and powerful words. They made their way to Gethsemane as Judas went out to betray the Lord. And then while they're there, we talked about that horrible time where Jesus is sweating the great drops of blood. And the Bible talks about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Well, it starts in Gethsemane. And it's kind of like a trail that goes from there all the way up to Golgotha to Skull Hill. And then in Gethsemane, as they finish the, Jesus finishes the prayer time. When they came for, to, to arrest Jesus and he declares who he is and Simon Peter steps forward with his sword and assaults Malchus, the high priest servant. The next service we dealt with the arrest, the trials, and then the beatings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we close that, that message in talking about the scourging, what was involved with scourging somebody. So as we get to this message in just a moment, we'll see that Jesus enters in that time bloody, beaten, just a terrible, terrible physical condition of everything he's already endured. Then last week, we kind of paused and looked back over where Judas betrayed the Lord and where Peter denies the Lord three times and talked about those two incidences. And we dealt pretty much the, the context of uh, the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. You know, there's just a lot of people. You say, well, what's the big difference? Somebody, two people come to the altar, it seems, and one seems to get right with God, and he goes out, and his life is forever changed. Another one kind of gets remorseful and sorrowful and cries as well. But you don't ever see a fruit from that. There's no real change in their life. So we dealt with the issue that there are, there are two kinds of remorse and sorrow. The genuine sorrow is that which brings us to the place where we truly give our hearts to Christ and we truly turn from our sins. Sometimes we just get in the mode where we just feel bad for what we've done. We don't recognize that what we have done is due to what we are, and we need a change. And only God can bring that change. But remember, as we get into this scenario of today, which is part five in dealing with the crucifixion of Jesus, remember as Jesus appears in this, in this part of everything that's gone on, you know, there's been this brutality that's taken place against him. There's been all the lies, the accusation. Not only has he suffered terribly and tremendously in Gethsemane, he's led from there. And, you know, before the Sanhedrin, he's, he's beaten. Before Pilate, he's beaten. Before Herod, he's beaten. Back to Pilate, he's ridiculed some more. Ultimately, to come back to the Sanhedrin, uh, they want Barabbas. Pilate goes back, has Jesus scourged. You think that's the end of it. He's barely holding on to a thread of life from the scourging. And now the, the message from the Sanhedrin is crucify. Crucify. That was their word for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was uh, where we kind of wrapped all these messages up. And I want to look at this today and as we look at part five with an understanding that everything you've ever learned in school, everything you've ever learned in business, everything you've ever learned at your particular trade pales in comparison in history even to what happened on this particular day when Jesus Christ goes and dies on the cross for the sins of all mankind. It is the apex of events outside the resurrection, obviously. These are all tied together. But this is the apex of everything, that, uh, the greatest events in all human history. The only thing that will top this, the resurrection, is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And th those are the, the premier events of all time in history. As we look at this today, I want us to somehow get back to that mindset where we've left off of going back in our hearts and minds. Use a little bit of your sanctified imagination today. And let's go back in, in time and, and let's just travel back to Jerusalem, those ancient streets of Jerusalem. Let's get back to that time. Remember, the city is at, at, during Passover. There's millions, they say, would come up to Jerusalem at this time. The whole countryside has come to the city. It's Passover. It's the time when the high priest is going to make that big sacrifice, sacrificial offering on the blood, of the blood on the altar. But here's Jesus during this event. And he's standing there and the word goes out to crucify. Well, crucifixion's already planned for this day for two other. And Jesus is now to become the third party in that group of those who are going to be crucified on Passover day. Here we are, what we'll start at the fortress of Antonio. The trials have taken place here. Pilate has made his arguments here. Jesus has confessed to his deity here and to his kingship and to his lordship and to his headship over all things. And then while we're here at the beginning of this path, we'll call it the Via Della Rosa, it leads out of, from the Roman Praetorium, the fortress of Antonio, leads through the winding streets of the old city of Jerusalem, makes its way out Damascus Gate, and not too far from Damascus Gate, there's a hill there called Golgotha. So here we have the beginning of this time where Jesus is to be crucified, and the cross is the first thing that we're drawn to, it appears. Now the cross is carried and it's presented to these criminals and to the Lord Jesus Christ because it was the custom, the custom of the day for the accused to bear their own cross. Interestingly enough, there's no fault with Jesus, so he's not bearing his own cross. He's bearing our cross. The wages of sin is death. Write it in your heart and your mind as we go through this sermon. The wages of sin is death. Jesus is now getting ready to bear the weight of our sin on that cross himself. Now, if you follow what's going on here, there's a group of soldiers that's going to appear and they're going to start this, this parade through the crowded streets of Jerusalem. You'll see them as they mount their horses, some on foot back, sword, shield, helmet glistening in the sun as they move the people out of the pathway who've gathered in Jerusalem and they press forward. Behind that first part of the guard, you'll see these three men carrying their crosses, the two thieves, the Lord Jesus. And they're behind that first procession as they press their way through. Surrounded and behind them are those who will be carrying out the execution itself. Those who will nail these criminals to the cross. Those who will push that big cross into, the, into place where they will hang on those crosses. Behind them, probably more troops. Behind them, the civil authorities. Behind them, the ecclesiastical authorities. The Bible tells us that the high priest was there. The rabbis, the leading, the Sanhedrin, the 70 rulers of, Egypt, of Israel, they're all gathered behind them. And behind them is the crowd that follows because the Bible says there were a great number of people who moved along. And I'll share that scripture with you a moment when it just gives you a brief insight. But as the crowd follows, they make their way through the streets of Jerusalem, these three bearing their crosses. Remember, Jesus has already much more than these other just criminals, has already borne the brunt of a great deal of agony and pain and distress. And you see Jesus so beaten, so bruised, so swollen, so bloody already, as Isaiah said, and we read last week, you, could not, you, could not, you would not recognize him if you hadn't known him personally. Remember, as Jesus walks this path, it is him who knew no sin. Jesus had never sinned. So he's walking this pathway. He's going down the Via Della Rosa for you and for me. He's dealing with the awfulness of this whole issue for us. And he's dealing with our greatest enemy, which is sin, which is death and destruction. And Jesus walks through this valley of death for you and me. Now we walk through, the Bible says in Psalms 23, we proceed through the valley of the shadow of death. We only have to go through the valley of the shadow of death because he already traversed this path and faced death on our behalf and removed the sting and the agony and the pain of death for those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes to carry our sins, 
to carry them, to bear them on the cross and to carry them to the grave and to break open a pathway for us that we don't have to bear those things. He's the one who moves ahead of us. He's the one who removes the obstacles. He's the one who deals with death. He's the one who breaks the back end out of death and makes a freeway for us to follow. And here they are in this crowded city, pressing through in the early morning hours to make their way to Skull Hill. As they go, the Bible tells us about a man named Simon. And Simon's an interesting study, which we don't have to, time to go into in this particular study. But by the way, this particular man, Simon, is the one who carries the cross of Jesus. Remember, Jesus is barely hanging on to life as it is. But here's Simon of Serene. It says, they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Serene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear Jesus cross. And by the way, this is the only man who's ever been compelled to carry the cross of Christ. Everyone who picks up the cross and follows Jesus from that point on is voluntary. We choose to reject or to receive. We choose to disciple and to follow or we choose to be deserted. We reject the cross of Christ or we learn what it is all about and we embrace the cross of Christ. It's a voluntary part for you and for me. Will you choose to take up the cross? Will you choose to to follow Jesus Christ as your own Lord, as your own Savior. This is the only one who's ever been compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. And why shouldn't we, once we understand what this is all about, why shouldn't you and why shouldn't I say, I'll take that cross, I'll bear that cross, because we know everything it stands for and everything it represents. It is the pathway to glory. It is, I mean, I don't care what they said the stairway to heaven was, all right, back in the 70s and 60s. The real stairway to heaven is the cross of Jesus Christ. It is what we mount. It is what we go up. It is the step by which we enter in to our heavenly places with Christ. At the moment of salvation, the Bible says, we become seated with Christ in heavenly places. But it's all because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Simon Serene, you see him compelled to carry the cross as they make their way out to the city, to the edge of the city. There's still one more place that, that history records for us in the Gospels. When Jesus sees that group of people, there's, there's the mad and the glad and the bad and the indifferent, but there are those who are there who are weeping as well. And Jesus refers to these women that he sees weeping as the daughters of Jerusalem. Luke 23 says a great multitude of people were following now, we know multitude in scriptures deals with thousands upon thousands of people. And there's these thousands of people pressing, the, following this parade, you know, this somber, gruesome parade of death through the city streets. And Jesus is there and he sees these women weeping and he speaks to them and he says, listen, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. What he's doing here, and again, remember through this whole thing of, of agonies, we always see Jesus ministering, whether it's in Gethsemane, you know, as he ministers to the high priest servant and heals his ear, or wherever he's at, there's this passion, this grace, and this mercy that keeps pouring through Jesus. If you follow the rest of that scripture, Jesus says, don't weep for me, weep for your children. He goes on to say, for the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren women and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? Now this is a moment where Jesus is basically reminding them of the prophecies, and he's prophesying to them. And we see part of these prophecies fulfilled not too many years after the Lord's death and resurrection, and the rest of them are yet to be fulfilled as the book of Revelation talks about the judgments of the last days and the vows of wrath that will be poured out upon the earth during the time of great tribulation. So there's reference made to these and Jesus said, as much as you would weep for me, you better weep for yourselves. Because there's going to come a day when you wish you'd never had children or you never were born and you'll beg the mountains to fall on you. Part of those days were in 70 AD when Titus came through. History records that he came in and ransacked, destroyed Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple. As Jesus said, it would be destroyed and prophesied. Completely destroyed. Well, if you ever read the history of those, the, the accounts, and Josephus, what he writes, he said that they slaughtered so many Jewish men, women, and children. They slut, slit their throats. They said the blood just poured into the streets. They set the entire city on fire. 
fact, he records that the blood ran through the streets so thickly that it put fire out in the lower parts of the city. It was a tragic moment which Jesus said, you know, there's a greater day of judgment coming. The answer to that judgment is what was happening to Jesus Christ at this point in time where he'll be received. And if you don't receive what he's done, what's going to happen when things are more severe, when judgment genuinely falls on all humanity? Right now, in this moment, as we see what's recorded here, history has judgment, God has judgment, falling on the sun in our stead for us so that we don't have to face those other judgments. But as they make their way, as he speaks to these women, and there's this weeping and wailing, they make their way through the city gates. And as they come out of the city gates, and even where you can go to Jerusalem today, and you can see those ancient Damascus gates, and they're just a couple of steps off from where the present day gates of, of Jerusalem are. You go down about 10 or 12 feet. You have to remember, Jerusalem has been built and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt more than any other city in history. But they've excavated down, the archaeologists have, the, the original streets. That Jesus came, that gate which he came out. And as you go outside the city gates, and by the way, that's where the, the judgments always took place outside the city gates. That's why Jesus had to be carried outside the city gates. And you can read a lot of that in history and scripture, New Testament, Old Testament, to get a clarity on what that's all about. But it represents that outside where judgment is, is where Jesus goes. And he goes to a place called Golgotha. I mean, even to say that, it just sounds bad. Golgotha. Skull Hill. Today in modern world, when you walk out Damascus Gate and kind of traverse your way across the street and down the block there, there's a hill that is there today. And you can clearly see that it, it has what you would obviously say a few couple thousand years ago would be more like a skull then prior to wind and rain and erosion, but still has that, that semblance to a skull that's there, Golgotha, Skull Hill. A place of death, a place of execution, a place of sorrow, a place of pain. A hill stands there. The Bible talks about in the psalmist, where's our help come from? It comes from the hills. Well, folks, I want you to know the greatest help you'll ever discover comes from that hill, the Skull Hill, where our help comes from. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when he reaches that place, that the soldiers take him and they tear his garments off him. They rend his garments from him to prepare him for this act and for this sacrifice. And that he's laid now upon the wood of the cross and upon the tree. In fact, this is all part geographically of another, of a mountain range. This part of it is called Mount Moriah. Right now, sitting on that extended part of Mount Moriah is the Dome of the Rock up there for those who've been there. That's where the, that Isaac was laid upon the altar and where he was being ready to become a sacrifice and where the Lord sends an intermediary angel and he stops it and he says, and the Bible says the angel stayed the hand of Abraham. But on this day, on this part of Moriah, there's no voice. There's no stopping. There's no angel that's going to stay the hand of those who would sacrifice this particular son. And there he is at Golgotha. The Bible says it's 9 a.m. Mark 15, 25 says, you know, it was the third hour when they crucified him. By the way, remember on this day, this is the day that the high priest would enter into the, into the holy place in the temple. This is the day when he would come in and he would prepare himself very carefully. He would, he would put on garments upon himself that were made out of pure linen as he prepared himself. He would go in and pull back the veil of that holy place in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was and he would be carrying with him a vessel filled with the blood from a spotless lamb. And he would enter into it they tell us that there would be a rope tied around his ankles. There would be bells around the lower part of the garment so that if anything happened on the inside of that holy place, that place, that they would know about it and they'd be able to pull him out because no one's allowed to go in there. And this is the only time he would go in there once a year to confess the sins of the nation, to carry this blood to sacrifice, to pour it upon this altar, and it would be sprinkled upon the altar. And he would only spend as much time as necessary it was a fearful place. It was a holy place. It was a sacred place. 
He would enter to that place to confess the sins of the people, then only to come out to out of the veil to close it behind him and to announce to the people there who had repentant hearts that their sins had been forgiven, that God had accepted this offering. But now you see a different high priest. You see Jesus as he's clothed in holiness. He's wearing this new vestige called our flesh. He became a man for us, but he didn't taint it. He had no sin nature. He is a spotless, pure offering before God. And there he approaches this moment, and the vessel in which the blood is, is, is not in some silver vessel or cup or golden offering vessel. It is his own body. The Bible says that he offered his own body as, a, as an offering for our sin. And he goes to this holy place at Golgotha to present himself. As he gets there, we know the scripture records for us that he turns to those who obviously taking these criminals and binding them to the cross. The Bible offers us this picture of Jesus humbling himself, willingly giving up himself. He says, no man takes my life from me. I give it willingly. If we could just somehow get a little bit of a sanctified understanding in our mind of Jesus and see that picture of the Son of God bearing a crown of thorns, bleeding from the beating, from the abuses, from the wounds on his back, humbling himself, lowering himself to the ground and laying himself out on this cross, on those wooden beams, stretching out his own arms and saying, no man gives him takes this life for me, I give it willingly. The Bible records that these Roman soldiers came out with spikes. We say nails are more like spikes, and they literally pounded these into his flesh. Now, the, the methodology was unique. You had to be careful in placing the spikes. Many people say it's right here around the wrist joint, not up here where you see a lot of pictures, because remember, the weight of the body is going to be suspended hanging. And so you can't have a place where it will literally tear through the flesh and what little sinews are there. They said, it's down here in the wrist between where the arm and the wrist, all that meets there together. And it had to be done uniquely and carefully so as not to, not to strike that main artery going through the wrist because, you know, you didn't want him to die from loss of blood here. Crucifixion is about suffocation. Crucifixion is about slow agony. Crucifixion is about suffering deeply, greatly, horribly. And so they placed the nail against the flesh in just the right place, and it would be pounded into the wood below his flesh, piercing his skin. Then the other side would be done as well. The nail placed properly, the nails pounded through his flesh, into the tree, and then to his feet, the same thing, and he opens not his mouth, the Bible says. But you must understand that as much as he is God, he is also man, so he is sensing feeling every nerve on fire as he's experiencing this moment. The nails are driven in. And then the tragic moment where the cross is lifted and literally the weight of his body begins to tear and the flesh begins to rip as he's suspended in air. So cross then is pushed in most likely to a support hole where it's shoved in and the whole weight comes down and his whole body feels everything and you know that every fiber, every nerve is on fire in this moment. They say it's the most excruciating, painful way for anyone to ever die. I, I never really understood a lot of this until one day I sat down and somebody gave me an article from the Journal of American Medical Association written back in March of 86. And it was written by a Mayo Clinic pathologist by the name of Dr. William Edwards when he did a study on the cross as a pathologist. Here's what he wrote. He said, once a body was suspended on a cross, the weight on arms and shoulders made it difficult or impossible to exhale fully after each breath, causing slow painful death from respiratory failure. The worst pain came from the nerves in the wrist and the feet that had been damaged by the nails and from muscle cramps caused by fatigue and lack of oxygen. For any of you that ever played sports or been out, you know what happens when you get dehydrated and you hadn't stretched out properly. I mean, you, you get that muscle cramp. I mean, you feel like you just, it feels like you just, it's horrible. I mean, if you've ever had a cramp in a leg muscle, foot or an arm or something, you know how just miserable that is. His whole body's experiencing that in this moment. Wretched pain. It's unbelievable. It, is what it, be, uh, it defies description, I believe. And then the tragedy is, as they say here, you can't breathe. You, to breathe, you have to pull yourself up against the nails. You have to push against that nail that is, that is in your feet. You have to shove yourself up just to get 
a breath. But that's the agony of the cross. That's why crucifixion is so horrible. That's why it's so terrible. Just to breathe for any breath. You follow this through. The scripture says at this point, as Jesus is up there suffering on the cross, one of the first things he says while on the cross, he says, he says Father, forgive them. Now, you and I both know that's not what we would have said. Is this what I get? I have done nothing wrong. I have helped you. You were hungry and I fed you. You were sick and I healed you. You saw everything I did, everything I said, everything pointed to the fact this is God in the flesh and this is what you do. The worst of that I can't imagine is what must have been happening in heaven. It had to be an absolute silence and shock and awe amongst the, the myriads, the Bible says, the ten thousands of ten thousands of ten thousands of heavenly hosts. Father, forgive them. They don't know. And we didn't. And many still don't today. Don't have any comprehension of what's really going on here. Now, if you follow this, there's about three groups of people. You can divide up this, this whole multitude of people that are watching all this. It really breaks down into three groups. The obvious group are the soldiers. They're there. They're doing their job. All right. Now, it says they're, they're there and they're, they're playing games for, for the garment of Jesus. They're, they're, they're casting lots. Now, there's a lot of people that kind of fall in that whole category. They're just playing games. They come to church. They hear the truth. Yet they continue to do their own thing, live their own life. It's not relevant to who they are as a person. It's not relevant to how they live their lives. It's not relevant to how they conduct themselves in the world that they live in, how they live as a, in their home. It's just not relevant. And it's, it's just a big deal. And they may be, even part of that group may get moved occasionally. But there's nothing genuine. Now, when I looked at this a little bit closer, to me, I started looking at it carefully and I thought, and uh, remember when I started this series, it's really about 20 sermons. We, we're kind of boiling down to six or so. This in itself, this one incident where they're casting lots for the garments of Jesus, this is a sermon in itself if we took the time to it. I began to look at this. As we've looked at this whole study, remember that not each incident is recorded in each gospel. Different witnesses, different perspective, different view as the Holy Spirit gives insight to us. And so we have Mark's view, Matthew's view, you know, Luke and John. But now when you look at this particular incident at the cross, every one of the gospels records this incident. Now, if something's in every gospel, then I think you need to pause for just a moment. What's going on here? In fact, it, not only is it mentioned, it is also prophetic. In Psalms 22, it says, you know, they parted my garments and, and, and then they cast, they cast lots from my vesture. What's going on here? Boy, there's such a great picture. And again, we'll, we'll do this one next year. And we talk about this one incident because it's important to realize that there, there's, a, there's a garment that's important here. The Bible says with that seam, it had value. It's worth something. But the greater garments there on the cross is Jesus. That garment represents that seamless life of Jesus. He, he, he's perfect. He's without sin. That garment represents back in Genesis when, when God came into the garden after Adam had sinned. He said, Adam, where are you? And the Bible says they were hiding themselves because they were naked. That garment represents the righteousness of Jesus Christ who ultimately clothes us because the Bible tells us we are naked before God. We are every act of our life, every sin of our life, all the iniquity of our life, it's exposed. And the only way that we're going to ever enter into God's presence is to become clothed with his righteousness. And it's of great value. It's supreme value. In fact, the Bible tells us to put on Jesus daily. So you have here this, this moment where they're standing below the cross and they're, they're taking these seamless garments and, and they're, they're casting lots for them. Well, let me, I've got good news for you. You don't have to cast lots for them. You don't have to play the lotto for them. Amen. They're a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we inherit that gift according to Scripture when we surrender our hearts to Christ. Another group is there, and it's the Sanhedrin, the, re, the re, revilers. They said, in the same way the chief priest, along with the scribes and the elders, you know, there's probably about a group of 100 men over here. And they're mocking Jesus. And they're saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross. And we'll believe in him. He trusts God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him. And they continued. For he said, I'm the son of God. Of course, the robbers who have been crucified with them were also insulting him. One of them was with the same kind of words. 
But I want you to look at these words. They are prophetic words. These men are speaking the truth and don't even realize what they're saying. When they said, you know, he saved others, absolutely, and he is still saving others today. It's by this very act that he is saving others. He cannot save himself. He would not save himself. He's committed to the cross. He's made a holy covenant with the Father that he's going to give himself as a ransom for others, so he cannot save himself because he's true to his word. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. He's the king of the universe. He's the king of all humanity. And one day the Bible says every knee will bow down and confess that he is the king. He's the Lord of Lords. The catch through this whole process, it says he trusts in God. If you see anything from the beginning of the life of Jesus to the end of his earthly life and ministry, he trusts in God. Any path we should follow should be the same. We trust in God. He said, let God rescue him now. Little did they know that in three days he'd be raised from the dead. God would rescue him in that moment because God the Father did delight in him. What a, what a moment in time and eternity. So everything they're saying here is ultimately prophetic. And then that third group, those were those who kind of saw the truth. Soldiers, disciples, a mother. Small group of the caring. Right in the midst of this dying agony, Jesus speaks again. Pulls himself up just to get a breath. Woman, behold thy son. Someone said, well, why didn't he say mother? Well, he stands there as the accused. Maybe even in his mercy and his sympathy, he doesn't say to her, mother, guilt by association. To endanger her. To be her to be threatened in this situation. But in that, just like at the garden, let all these go. Just take me. Don't involve anybody else. The sheep are supposed to scatter. And I think also he didn't say mother because it did not want to happen what has happened among so many circles that we would venerate Mary. The only one to be venerated, exalted is the Lord Jesus Christ. She's a woman. She can't out answer your prayers. She is not a mediator, she's not a savior. Jesus is the mediator. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the savior. You can't pray to Mary. It's a useless effort. We pray only to one. The scriptures makes it clear. From the beginning to the end, there's only one mediator between God and man. It is Jesus Christ. Amen. And he speaks to John. He says, behold, thy mother. And he gives to John this burden of responsibility for his Worldly mother, as mother of this realm, behold her. But understand, it's not so much a burden as it is an honor. Isn't that the way people think, though? We, God tells us or gives us something and places a place of ministry or service or something, like that, and it's just a terrible burden. We have yet to understand the, the glory and the blessing and the honor that we receive from doing anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then obviously as we get through the end of the crucifixion, we'll go ahead and mention him now, this one Roman soldier who declared, who declared with reality and truth whether he gets redeemed or not, we do not know, but he makes that declaration, this is the Son of God. Had to be. Who else could do this with such dignity, amidst such horror, amidst such filth, amidst such iniquity, but Jesus Christ. Now, these statements and these activities have taken place over a period of three hours where Jesus, for every breath, has to push himself up and pull himself up. The Bible says there were two thieves. One on each side, he's in the middle. One was scoffing, if you're the son of God, like the others were. If you're the son of God, save yourself, save me. There's still a lot of people who only want to come to God when they've got something in it for them. What, what are you going to give me out of this deal? And they get mad when God doesn't do it. Why, if you're God, why don't you do this? They missed the mark. And there's one believing who says, remember me. I think I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago about a book I'd been reading called The, the Day I Was Crucified from the eyes or perspective of the Lord Jesus telling this story instead of the witnesses telling the story. And it's a fascinating book, and it's very biblical. I mean, they, what they, they do is they just, it's, it's a little bit of sanctified imagination, but if Jesus were telling the story instead of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. But when it came to this part about the, the, the thief that, you know, who says, I'm here justly, I mean, he's a, he, he's a scoundrel, all right? And apparently he's such a bad thief, he, des he, he deserves crucifixion, all right? 
Jesus turns to him and says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. I was reading this book on this particular incident, and it started out with these two angels. This chapter didn't. And these two angels are standing there, and they're talking, and they're just kind of blown away by everything that's just taking place in the earthly realm. And there, there's sadness, there's heaviness, there's sorrow. What's going on? What's going to happen? What's going to be a result of this? You know, they're just in awe. And the one looks says, look, what is that? And one says, I, I don't know. I, I've never seen anything like it. And they say, well, is, is it one of the unclean ones? Is it one of the, the demons or the lucid? No, it's not him. Look, there's purity. It's, it's righteousness. It's, but is it the son? No, it's, it's not the son of God, but it's like, and it's, but it's not. And, you know, as they're going confused about what they're going to do and how they're going to respond, it gets closer and closer. And finally, it's in their presence, this, this being is. And they say, who are you? Who are you? person responds, is it today? Is it today? He said, today I'd be in paradise. And that's the beauty of what God does when he changes and sanctifies and cleanses our life. Everything we were is not seen anymore. Everything we had done is forgiven again. We are made right. You quit bearing those bondage chains. You're free and you're new and you're whole in Christ Jesus. So much so that it is awe-inspiring according to scripture, to even the angels. What a great moment. This day you'll be with me in paradise. Remember, the Bible says now at the sixth hour. It's noon. Luke says, it was now about the sixth hour and darkness falls over the whole land until the ninth hour. When this starts, it starts getting dark. And the more it goes on, by the ninth hour, complete darkness has enveloped the land. It's nighttime and daytime. It's nighttime at noon. Now, I've heard a lot of sermons on this. Some were saying, you know, that, you know, that uh, Jesus is becoming sin and he's so ugly that even the Father can't look upon him. And all those have some relevance. But basically what's happening here, I believe a veil is being drawn. A different veil, not the one over at the temple that, that, that symbolizes, but a greater veil where, where of, of separation. Jesus has spent three hours in agony, gasping, dying, gagging for each breath on the cross. Now darkness covers completely the, the earth as they know it, and as, as though God refuses to look on. Remember, we said this is about the time where the high priest is getting ready to enter in. The high priest ministry began with Aaron, remember, Moses' brother. And every high priest after that came after the order of Aaron. But now it's not the Aaronic priesthood. It's not Caiaphas that's going to enter in to this new dark veil and go behind it to make this sacrifice. Now it is the true high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he enters into this time, to this holy of holies, as this thick veil of darkness separates us. It's Jesus going in to sprinkle his own blood. He is the holy son of God. And now he's getting ready to become the unholy offering as he who knew no sin becomes sin that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is the worst of the agonies of the cross. We talk about how bad the physical is. The crucifixion, the horror, the agonies, the pain, the hurt, but the nails and the whip. But now he faces sin and demons and death and hell and the grave. And apparently, this is so hideous that God brings darkness over the earth. Three hours of darkness. Then during this time that Jesus proclaims, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Martin Luther, after meditating, he said, long hours and without food for quite some time. He finally left that place of meditation and exclaimed, who can understand God forsaken of God? The words of Psalm 22, where it talks about being forsaken, being alone, being rejected, Written by David, but David never experienced those kind of things. Your garments, you know, being separated, lots being cast for him. You know, the, 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 the rejection of, of, of all those. Jesus is the one it's speaking about. Because the whole cup of sin, the whole cup of guilt, the whole cup of defilement is being poured out upon him. And the worst and the most bitter drop of that cup was this, forsaken of God. My God. My God. 
Why have you forsaken me? We don't know exactly how many minutes or moments or hour maybe went by during this time. The Bible tells us that he spoke again, pulling himself up against the agony of that cross. I thirst. Scriptures record that they took gall and vinegar to offer to him, but that's not what he was thirsty for. Out of his own lips, the Lord Jesus said, made that declaration that he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness will be filled. And he's making that declaration of thirst to his father. I thirst. I thirst. Psalm 69 prophetically declares, I'm weary with my cry. And my throat is parched, and my eyes fail while I wait for my God. I'm not thirsty for the torment to be done with. That'd be fine enough. But thirsty for fellowship, the holy trinity of God. Again, we don't know the moments that expire here. But he pulls himself up and declares, it's finished. Words, telesta, I paid for it. What's finished? The agony of the cross? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the penalty for my sin, the penalty for your sin, the price that had to be paid if we're ever going to be forgiven. It's paid for. There's a law in the land that if you, you committed a crime against the civil government, You'd be brought before that Roman tribunal. They, they gloried in their law system and their legal system. And if you were found guilty, you were given a fair trial. And the trial would be representing would, what you had done would be brought before the judge. And if you were found guilty, the indictments against you would be written out in legal documents. Sealed with a Roman seal. You'd be cast into prison, incarcerated. And then they would take that document and it would be placed in the, on the cell door where you were. When you finish fulfilling your time, say you were given a year, a month, six years, ten years, when you had done your time, that document would be taken as the door would be opened to you and it would be printed, paid for on it, and sealed with a Roman seal again. Colossians says that he took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and he nailed it to the cross. Your sin, my sin, all taken, listed, nailed to the cross. And Jesus says, paid for. It's finished, it's done. And then he says, with his last breath, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Folks, I want you to know that this is life giving into death. You know, if he hadn't said that, he'd probably still be hanging there today. You can't kill life. He's the very, he is the way, the truth, and the, the life. And so he has to give it up as an offering. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now in this moment, the Bible clearly records that down in the temple where the offerings are being made, the veil is rent from the top to the bottom. It's a miraculous event. No man, no group of men. They say it would take a team of two oxen, two teams of oxen, pulling that veil apart to tear it in half. It was so thickly woven, so carefully constructed. But it's torn from top to bottom. Just as the day before when Caiaphas stands to rend his garment, recognizing the end of that high priestly ministry because there's a new high priest in town. Now the veil is rent, recognizing very clearly that, hey, that which had us separated from God, that door of darkness, that veil, that curtain, no longer exists because Jesus now deals with it with his own flesh and with his own body. He pays the price for sin. Now a highway, that open door is made to every one of us. When he says, I am the doorway, I am the gate, that's who we go through now. That's the pathway to forgiveness. That's the pathway to cleansing. Now, there's a lot we can't get into today. You just read these events, take the Gospels, open each one. You'll realize at one part there was an earthquake. And the Bible says it was so, vicious, it was so violent, it shook the city. In fact, it says it opened up the graves of many of the Old Testament saints. And if you follow the scriptures, it says some of those saints came out of those graves and went through the city testifying 
of the Lord Jesus. Now that's freaky, I know. Can I explain it? No. Do I believe in ghost hunters on Sci-Fi Network? No. Are these ghosts? No. These are souls and these are men. Can you imagine running into Moses saying, everything I've got, I wrote about has now been done in that man who is the God man. He's the temple. He's the tabernacle. He's the word of God. He's all those things. It's done. Now there's no longer this place of, of paradise. It's closed down. Now we can actually go into the very presence of God. And the Bible says he led captivity captive. Open the doors. You see, the Old Testament saints couldn't go into heaven. That's why there was Abraham's bosom. Because sin hadn't yet been conquered and defeated. In the, because Jesus hadn't shed his blood. As I say, there's many things that we could talk about. But no wonder John called him, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Now, I started this message by talking about how Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies, but let me give you just a couple that he fulfilled in the Old Testament, all right? I mean, so, the soldiers, can we get to this first? I get ahead of myself. The soldiers came to break his legs. Why do you break the legs? You break the legs so they can't breathe anymore. The other soldiers were still, the other, the, those two criminals, they're alive. Their legs are broken. Why? Now I can't push myself up. Now, now I, can't, I can't get a breath. And the only way, way I can get up now is just pull against the nails here. I can't, can't use my whole body. And pretty soon I can't breathe and I die. The Bible says Jesus has already given up the ghost. He's already committed his spirit to the Father. He's already yielded up his life. There's no reason. And by the way, that is prophetic. Jesus was, it was it, it prophesied his legs would not be broken. Not one body would, of his, not one bone of his body would be broken. They did pierce his side. They took a sword. But again, that's prophetic in Zechariah 12, 10. It said they pierced his side and the water and the blood came forth. Ultimately, scientists tell us that Jesus died of a broken heart. There had to be this rupture that took place in his heart. His heart exploded within his breast for a blood and water to be mixed there together. But remember, that's what he was there for, to shed his blood. He was there to give himself. Old Testament prophecies, Isaiah 53, we know of, that he was silent with before his accusers like a lamb led to slaughter. Psalm 69 said he was offered gall and vinegar. Isaiah 53 says he was crucified with sinners. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says that, you know, he was smitten. He, was, he spat upon Psalms 22 talks about that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Zechariah 12, his, his side would be pierced. All that to pay for your sin, to pay for my sin. I mean, Jesus knows all this is coming. Why in the world go through it? What brings a man to face such an end? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12, it was for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He dealt with it. He put up with it. He went through it. He despised the shame, but he did it anyway. Why? There was joy. What was the joy that was out there? What, what kept him looking beyond that to something out there? What was it that was out there that delighted him, that pressed him, that motivated him? What it was, was you, Amen. was me. Amen. It was us. The Bible says God gave his one son and has ultimately re reaped many sons under redemption. We're the prize. I know you don't think you're much a prize, but God does. And he loves you dearly. And he despised the suffering, the horror, the pain of sin. Not, not, not his. He went to the cross because of ours. The Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He hung on the tree for you and me. But it was his love, ultimately, that drove him there. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were sinners, while we were unholy, while we're ugly in the sight of God, while we're despicable in our iniquity, while, there, while we're still all that, God loved us. What would drive him? The only way God will ever get to know us is sin has to be dealt with. His love manifests in such a triumphal way that he dealt with sin and overcame it. And ultimately, you know why? Because the hope that gives us, hope of being saved, hope of being delivered, hope from hell, hope from death, hope from grave, hope for eternity. The Bible calls it the hope of glory. That's the hope we have. Why did Jesus die for you? Don't forget this fact. 
Scriptures make it clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Leviticus put this way. The life of the flesh, it's in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by the reason of the life that makes atonement. Basically, put in a nutshell, God says to us three or 4,000 years ago, life is in the blood. I'm giving my blood, I'm giving my life for you to atone for your sins. Now, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, science, I think in the mid to late 50s, scientists came up with this brilliant discovery. Life's in the blood. <laughs> it's fun when science catches up a few thousand years later. <laughs> but it is. And Jesus says, I'm giving my life for you. And we know that they took him down from the cross. He was laid in a borrowed tomb because he didn't plan on keeping it. He was going to give it back. Laid in a borrowed tomb. Sealed. If you pull back the veil on the Holy of Holies and you look at the mercy seat of God, at each end is an angel with wings outstretched and heads bowed. We know from what the scripture reads that attending to the grave of Jesus were two holy angels. And when Mary came, the angels were there. And we look into that grave and we see the true Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had in it Aaron's rod that budded, the law, the stones, the scriptures there. Jesus is all those things to us. And everything we see in the Old Testament, you see in reality inside that tomb while the angels attended. As Jesus leaves that body, goes and releases and closes down paradise, those saints of old are delivered into the heavenly of heavenlies. They get to experience that something better we get. There's no holding period for us. Then he's into the Father's presence at one part where the blood, his blood, is being sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven before his Father. The price is paid. No one has to go to hell. No one has to die empty. No one has to live alone. No one has to bear the condemnation of their sin anymore. The price is paid. Amen. I'll close with this one thing. About a year or so after I got saved, I was reading a book. And I can't remember the name of the book. I remember the author. I believe it was Leonard Ravenhill. And I read a little sentence. He was talking about the crucifixion. And he, there was a statement made. I, I'm, I'm almost positive it was Raven Hill. It might have been Roy Hesse as he wrote on the Calvary Road. But one of those men, not necessarily important is what he said. And what they said stuck with me. I've not been able to escape it since those early years of me getting my life to Jesus. And I'm glad. But maybe it'll stick in your brain too. It said this. After describing the cross, it said, there's a question. Is the life you're now living worth Christ dying for? In other words, does your life bring honor to what he's done? Does your life serve as that eternal remember me? Is the life you're now living worth Christ dying for? We can't live in a way to save ourselves, only he can save us. But once we are saved, our lives are changed, and we ought to be living out of that new person, living as that new believer, living as that new person in Christ Jesus, living with the power that God's promised us, living in faith, following him, praising God for him, loving him, embracing the cross, and following him to wherever he leads us. Is the life I'm now living worth Christ dying for? And too often, I'll be honest, I have to say no. But I want it to be. Don't you? And the only way we can do that is to get rid of the baggage and the junk and the sin that's in our heart. Go back to the scripture in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. How can he, how can he forgive us and cleanse us? Because it's all been paid for. And so he's faithful to remember the covenant relationship of the cross. He's faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me. And I can walk away right with God to serve him. 
Would you stand with your heads bowed? I would say to you today, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, in this moment, I'd ask you to look at your own heart and life. If there's never been a time where you've trusted the Lord truly, where you've turned to follow Him, that real repentance the Bible talks about, not that remorsefulness, where you made a commitment to follow Christ, what would hinder you? I mean, just think about everything you've